kid. You've been playing with Fred Anderson for quite some time. How did you first meet Fred Anderson, and how, how did your musical relationship develop? The first time I heard about Fred, Eddie Harris told me about Fred. Oh, really? Uh, Eddie Harris used to come to New Orleans and play, mm -hmm. and sometimes we'd practice a shared together mm -hmm. with him and Alvin Baptiste, and sometimes my son Kent. And he told me, he said, you've been playing free. You know, so you think you're playing free, but I know somebody who's been playing free before the Second World War, after the Second World War, something like that. Wow. I said, wow. And then uh, I was reading about the ACM in the Downbeat magazine when they first started, and I tried to join. Mm -hmm. And they told me I had to live in Chicago in order to be in it. Uh -huh. okay. So uh, that kind of messed me up a little bit. But I came to Chicago looking for Fred. Um, really? I was taking some lessons at Northwestern. I was studying saxophone in the summer, mm -hmm. and I came looking for Fred. But uh, Eddie Harris told me he played with Billy Grim. I thought he was saying Grimfield, <laughs> and it was Brimfield. Right. And no, I didn't. Couldn't find Grimfield. Couldn't find him in the book. Nobody knew who <laughs> Grimfield was. So uh, I missed him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when they had the 25th anniversary at ACM, mm -hmm. I think it was the 25th anniversary, they uh, uh, said uh, they would let Alvin Field and myself come in and play on the concert mm -hmm. with uh, a couple other people. Uh -huh. And Fred was on the concert. They paired me with Fred mm -hmm. and uh, so somebody, I forgot who all was on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what, that was our first meeting. But I had been trying mm -hmm. to uh, to you know meet him before that, but it just didn't happen. I, I don't see. know why. Yeah. And uh, one time I came into Chicago, and the AACM was playing at the Old Pumpkin Room, mm -hmm. and they had about thirty people on the stand. In mm -hmm. Moo Hall, uh, you know, I had a drummer. Uh, I can't think of his name now. He's deceased. He's from here. He used to play with Cecil Till and all of them. I'll mm -hmm. think of his name in a minute. Uh -huh. But uh, I tried to get him to run interference from me. He went and asked Moore. I said, Moore, they got a dude here from Chicago, mm -hmm. and some people say he can play. Mm -hmm. And Hall said, uh, he wouldn't let me play. He said, I didn't, how could I come from New Orleans and play that kind of music, you know? <laughs> so that was another blow to me. So, I, you know, I was trying to connect with some Chicago musicians right. and could have probably met Fred through them. Right. So uh, it didn't happen until that night that mm -hmm. we came in, Al Phil and myself, and did the concert. Uh -huh. okay. And we've been playing together ever since, I mean, as much as mm -hmm. we possibly can. Right. It was like a hand-in-glove kind of thing. Yeah. Immediately. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, I mean, right. the, the, all the records you've made, uh, right. every time I've seen you play together, it's just... And before I had been playing alto, uh -huh. and that night, I, I think that weekend I brought a tenor with me. I had been playing tenor and alto, but I had been basically playing alto. Mm -hmm. And that night I played tenor, and Fred was playing tenor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just went on. Yeah, great. And the uh, AACM, that 25th anniversary, that would have been, what, like middle 1980s, right? Or what? I don't, I don't know anything about dates. Dates, yeah. I can't deal with dates, but I knew okay. it, I think it was the 25th anniversary of ACM. Okay. Probably in the 80s. Okay, right, okay. So, um, after that concert and you and Fred started playing together, what was, what were like the next steps uh, for you both? What, uh, where, I where think did you go either, from there? Either he came to New Orleans, I met him, and Al Feely used to give concerts in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I forgot whether it was in Mississippi or New Orleans or, or, or here, mm -hmm. but uh, we started getting together. I knew after that it felt so good playing the first time, mm -hmm. and uh, we got together. I really don't know where it was. It might have been here, because I used to be coming up to Chicago quite frequently. I used to go to Northwestern and take lessons uh -huh. after, you know, so I don't know if it was here, or, but it it might have been down south, but we started playing because I started bringing him down on the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. I see. And then I started coming up here for this festival. Right. So it just snowballed from there. Right. 
Okay. Um, now, you said you had been searching Fred Anderson out right. for quite some time. Right. And could you explain what, uh, what it was about Fred Anderson's sound that, or, or whatever it was that you knew about him, what made him uh, so important to you to find him out and to... Uh, well, coming from Eddie Harris, Eddie Harris is, was, a good, is a, was a good musician. Right. And he didn't talk about people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't one of his things to glorify people. Mm -hmm. But he knew where I was. Right. And uh, he told me about Fred because he said Fred was, he knew I was committed to freedom and I was playing as free as I possibly could. And I couldn't get in it. Well, I wasn't working at all playing free music down there. Mm -hmm. But when I, you know, people would come through, I'd jam sometimes mm -hmm. and they could hear mm -hmm. where, where I was headed and what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, he thought that that would be the closest person of somebody who had been doing it well enough and somebody who he knew I was committed to it and he told me that Fred was committed to it also. Mm -hmm. And he told me the majority of the people in the AACM was in that direction. So I wanted to meet a group of people who who was who thought like, you know, people, you know, people sure. who think alike. Yeah. Because down in the south I just had a a very core cool of a about two or three people that we would play with. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So at, uh, until you actually met Fred and played with him, had you ever heard his music before? Mm -hmm. You were just going on Eddie Harris's Yeah, well, Fred had recorded that. Uh -huh. I think the first time Fred recorded was in Moore's. Right. No, I don't, mm -hmm. that Moore's album. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, had, I don't know if we had gone to Moore's around the same time or not, because mm -hmm. I had played Moore's back, but mm -hmm. I didn't... I can't like I can't remember you know dates just I just can't remember dates, mm -hmm. but uh, I knew he hadn't recorded because mm -hmm. I remember when they went to Moore's, mm -hmm. but uh, he hadn't he didn't have anything out so it wasn't anything that I could listen to. I see. Only thing I had to go was on Eddie Harris record, you know what he was talking about. Okay, so the first time you got together was actually before that Moore's tour is is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was one of Moore's tours with him. I right, made yeah. my band with the Moore's. Yeah. Okay. But they, they, it was around the same time. I don't know what year I went, but mm -hmm. I know we were all going to Moore's around the same time. I see. They might have went a year or two ahead of me or so. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so what do you think makes Fred Anderson such a significant voice? Because his voice is... I had no other voice like him. The mm -hmm. number one thing, mm -hmm. he got that big tenor sound that mm -hmm. Gene Ammons had. That's a, right. People used to talk about Gene, well, you know, that mm -hmm. tenor sound, that Chicago sound. Right. He got that big tenor sound. Mm -hmm. But other than that, his music is altogether original from anybody else I've ever heard. That's right. And are there, I mean, can you be a little specific? You know, what uh, uh, aspects, what, what do you hear in his sound? or his approach to music that makes him so distinctive, uh, an artist. Is there anything in particular that, you know, you focus on? I mean, his the, phrasing, the, the way he phrases, mm -hmm. and uh, his lines, the way, he hook his, the way his lines connect. Mm -hmm. I mean, he can connect the lines and can be going in a phrase, and at the drop of the head, he can turn and go another way, or, mm -hmm. or left-handed, you know what I'm talking about? He can be doing something and it's going down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he can switch gears and go completely in another direction. Mm -hmm. And it still make total sense. He can probably do it backwards and it would still make total sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm amazed at the way he does his, his thing. Right. Uh, I wish I could do that. But my thing is different. Mm -hmm. And if Fred can sit down and play solo by himself and make sense because his lines is coherent and what have you. Mm -hmm. But with me, I can't do that. I got to listen, I got to have some kind of stimulus to play off of. Okay. If, uh, like, sometimes I can listen to the birds and play with them and the trees and the mm -hmm. reeds, whatever. And I tell the people, if I don't have anything to play off, if I'm just there by myself, I can't do nothing but play scales. Mm -hmm. Now I can play some, diff all kinds of different scales, but to make them make sense, mm -hmm. it would be hard. But Fred can take his stuff and it can sound... You could probably move a, a, a rhythm section around him if they knew his mm -hmm. music, and it would make total sense because he could make total sense by himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And I, I haven't heard too many people that, I mean, now, people who deal with another kind of language, mm -hmm. he got a language all of his own. Mm -hmm. Now, some people who deal with another language, they all play similar because they're playing the same kinds of tunes mm -hmm. with the same kinds of changes. But Fred's stuff is so personal mm -hmm. that it would be, you know, it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. That's excellent. You excellent. know, I don't oh, ever yeah. hear him quote from other saxophone players, you know, what have you. But with me, I may play it something by train. I may play, if I hear it and it give me that stimulus, I'll do it or mm -hmm. something else or what have you. Mm -hmm. And I try to play coming from within, but I know if I listen, something may come out that I heard somebody else do or so forth. But Fred, very seldom you hear that with Fred. Mm -hmm. You right. know, it's really personal. Mm -hmm. You know. That's a great analysis of mm -hmm. Fred, because I've asked a number of musicians that, and that's probably oh, yeah. the, the most detailed response. That's, that's really, that sheds a lot of light. You seemed uh, right off the bat uh, to communicate with Fred on a very high uh, level, uh, an almost telepathic kind of level, and some of his other long-term uh, musical Partnerships uh, such as with Hamid and Harrison Bankhead have also remarked on that same uh, kind of communication that just happens automatically. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What? How did that? I mean, is that something that just happens, or what? Well, I listen to Fred and try to get out of his way because uh -huh. Fred is like a truck. If not, he'll run over. <laughs> <laughs> So I listen uh -huh. and try to play around mm -hmm. what the rhythm section is doing and listen at him and trying to play around that. Because mm -hmm. he's coming steamrolling straight ahead. Right. You know, and the, the sound is there. I mean, I don't know nobody who could match the sound. Mm. Nobody living, you know, so. That's right. And he's putting the air in the horn, so, and if he's going down, then I'll go up. Mm -hmm. You know, and try to play around us, you know, instead of not being in the same territory. Mm -hmm. So that's. One of the things, but basically it's just getting out of the way and, and weaving, weaving around what's going on mm -hmm. and listening to the rhythm section. Okay. Um, what do you think uh, Fred Anderson's greatest contributions are uh, to the music? What do you think that he should be most remembered for? Well, number one. For? for bringing up a whole new generation of musicians. You know, Fred brought Hamid and, and Douglas mm -hmm. and uh, George Lewis, mm -hmm. and all of those are some powerful musicians, and probably a lot of others that I don't know mm -hmm. or that was with him, and they just didn't complete the journey or still doing it for mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, number two, uh, for having the 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 where with to stick with the music because you can very well get discouraged with this music. That's right. And he built a club. I mean, I don't know anybody who built a club because I doubt if there was places where at around here in Chicago at one time had a whole lot of improvised music going on. Mm -hmm. But if it hadn't have been for him with the velvet, mm -hmm. you know, we would have some, it would have been really Mm -hmm. bad news for this type of music. That's right. Because you couldn't go in the major venues around here and do it. Mm -hmm. And Fred kept it going. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, I'm just so glad that he was able to hold on well enough yeah. where he got a beautiful one of, I mean, it's, his club is just like any other club right. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think with those three things, that's a, that's a lot to be remembered. And he's still doing it at his age. Mm -hmm. And still practicing every day as much as he possibly can. Yeah. Even yeah. through his health problems, he's still practicing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a tribute to somebody who really, that's an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, he really wanted to be an artist. And he did something mm -hmm. to change the community, to change the directions of other students. Mm -hmm. And all of those three, I know, I'm, I don't know, well, that's others, but I don't know them as well. I know those three. Mm -hmm. And all three of those are powerful musicians. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he raised his family. He worked and did all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, he was a man of the community. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he, you know, he did all of that. So mm -hmm. 
I can just commend them for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And number one, I've never seen Fred argue with anybody. I never saw Fred get mad. Mm -hmm. You know, really? I mean, he has a uh, real gentle yeah. nature. And I yeah. think about myself, I can get mad at a drop of a hat. <laughs> and I never saw Fred angry in his life. Is that right? Wow. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so he has an equal temperament. I mean, his temperament mm -hmm. is equal. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. And uh, uh, he's a friend of mine. I have a, some friends uh, that I came up with and some musicians. But Fred mm -hmm. is a friend just like a brother to me. Mm -hmm. And I have another musician friend, Alvin Fielder, right. drummer. Right. That's like a brother to me. Mm -hmm. But Fred is, you know, and Alvin introduced me to Fred, and through the years, mm -hmm. it's just like a brother. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, it's just that. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine yourself uh, as someone who could perhaps see into the future, uh, when the history of jazz is written, how do you think Fred Anderson will be, or how, how do you think Fred Anderson should be? thought of? How do you think he'll be remembered by the official history? I think Fred should be remembered as one of the giants in improvised music. Mm -hmm. He's as important as Cecil Taylor and Arnett Coleman mm -hmm. and all the rest of them with the, in their communities mm -hmm. and in this world community. Mm -hmm. They just happen to have had a, well you know like in anything there's some people gonna always get more exposure and more notoriety and all of this and you got to expect that. Mm -hmm. But I think he should be remembered as one of the giants in the 20th century improvised music. Right. Great. You must have a lot of stories about, I mean, a lot of memories about uh, playing music with Fred and things like mm -hmm. that. Any anecdotes, any situations that you think are particularly memorable? Anything that you'd like to recount? I'll tell you one time we had a band on the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Aja Ramu on drums, mm -hmm. Malachi Favors on, on bass, mm -hmm. Muhol on piano, mm -hmm. Fred Anderson, mm -hmm. myself on tenor, mm -hmm. George Lewis, and Butch Morris on trumpet. Mm. Wow. And that, that was a powerhouse. We played a concert at the school I was teaching at Southern University. Mm -hmm. At that time, we played a concert at Southern. Mm -hmm. And then we played on a jazz festival before Count Basie. Mm -hmm. And everybody, we, not everybody, but there were some members in Basie's band. That when we came off the stage, they said, man, I never heard nothing like that before. Wow. I mean, some of them were shook up. Mm. And you know, you don't shake Basie's band. Like we played before them. Yeah, right. And the whole band was out of the, out mm. of the trailer listening at what we was doing. Wow. And it was a, it was a work of art. Mm. And I thought, that George Ween told me that, and his secretary said, we're going to give y'all some work. We're going to take y'all on the road and let y'all do some things in some major venues. Mm -hmm. But it never happened. But that was a hell of a band. If I say one hit that we really had, that I can come to mind. But every hit is memorable with Fred. Mm -hmm. Fred and myself and Alvin Fielder play in the South. All of those was good. Mm -hmm. And when I played with Fred and Hamid and... And uh, when in an old velvet, uh, AJ Ramu mm -hmm. would play sometime when I mean, was out of town. AJ had a had a good feel for the for yeah. what we was doing too. Mm -hmm. Right. And then playing with some of the youngsters that was around there. Douglas. Sometimes we play and Douglas would be on the mm -hmm. on the bands there. Mm -hmm. And it looked like sometimes they would just catch fire just being in the in the and I I love to do that just to watch. When students catch on fire, you know, some oh. youngsters catch on fire, and sometimes they play so much, they say, wow. Mm -hmm. And I understand they'd be inspired to do something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So the majority of the time, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a good feeling. It's a, you know, it's something good. Mm -hmm. But that thing before basic, we had a semi, four horns on the front line and three rhythm, three in the rhythm. Uh -huh. So that was... That was one of the fantastic things, the way they reacted in, in the bass's band. Right, yeah. And you know, the type of stuff bass plays, you know, it's, diff it's altogether different, but they knew that this was some quality music that we was done. Right, yeah. yeah. 
Let's talk about that uh, a little bit about the uh, the positivity of the music. Uh, Hamid uh, mentioned that there's a uh, very spiritual uh, force and, and basis to Fred's playing. And I asked Fred about it, and he also uh, said that, yeah, that was so. Uh, how do you feel about that? The, the spiritual basis of the music, is, is that your opinion? And right, definitely. Definitely. Huh? And sometimes when we play it, I mean, you can just feel it. I mean, it's a whole different kind of thing. It's like a kind of out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Hamid playing and the mm -hmm. rhythm is going and Fred is bad now that we're doing it. I mean, it's like, I mean, you just feel love. It feels good. I guess right. I think about maybe that's the kind of way Train felt. Mm -hmm. When he was playing, you know, you mm -hmm. listen to that train play and say, "Wow, man, it, he must have been really having a ball." Mm -hmm. And uh, when we really hit it, you know it because you come off the stand and say, "Man, wow, that was something." Mm -hmm. That's know? right. And by the fact that uh, that well, when when we get together, it's like a happening. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you know you. Looking forward to it, like tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Right. It's been a while since we played together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Try to let the, all the creative juices flow. Mm hmm. You know. It's great. Uh, it was interesting that you mentioned Train because uh, I was also thinking about him and some of the other musicians that I've spoken with and uh, some of the other people that have been uh, following Fred's music. Over the last couple of years, they've been saying that he's been getting to reaching a level in his playing that uh, is just so strong and so rich that it's on the same level as Coltrane was uh, mm -hmm. when he was at his height. Would you agree with that, or how, how do you, what would you think of that? Well, uh, the feeling, I can understand what he's saying. See, sometimes mm -hmm. right. it's like in a, in the Baptist church or the sanctified church, mm -hmm. when you hit that thing, I, I hit a certain level, I call it the hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Like when you hit the hallelujah, I mean, it just is like, <laughs> what can you say? And I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Now, his music is totally different from Train. Train had a different approach or what right. have you, mm -hmm. but the same got the, they got the same kind of hallelujah in their playing. Mm -hmm. And that's what you can't, I mean, you can't define that. I mean, that's Right. Say so how are you gonna define a hallelujah in the plan? But mm -hmm. when you when they hit it, you know it. And he when he get out of his crouch, when he come up, you know that you know if you've heard something that's mm -hmm. as a work of art. That's right. Yeah, that's such a great description. Um, it also there's just such a difference uh, with players. And, and David S. Ware mentioned this also, where he said. Uh, you listen to a lot of horn players out there, and uh, or whatever uh, instrument they may play, and they may have gone to great schools. They may have uh, great talent, great chops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you don't have that kind of spiritual basis, right. you just you hear the difference right away, right. Yeah. and uh, it's a very palpable, real right. difference if you really know how to and listen I, to music. And I don't think Fred ever consciously tried to imitate anybody. Right. I mean, he listened to a lot of records and stuff, mm -hmm. but I don't think he consciously, because subconsciously, you know, things just uh, just get in your subconscious and you do it. Right. Like sometimes, uh, I don't really practice jazz, I practice my horn, mm -hmm. and I listen to very few records, but just by being on the scene and hearing different kinds of things, Subconsciously, things come in, and when you, they feel good, mm -hmm. I mean, you just do them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I come in and say, oh, yeah, that comes from so-and-so and so, so-and-so and so. But it still has, I try to put my identity on it. I won't just mm -hmm. play it exactly as clean as they play it or what have you. Mm -hmm. It'll be in my, in my kind of tonality. Right. You know, so it's a... Uh, and when the hallelujah come, I mean, you forget about all of that. You just go for broke. I mean, when you <laughs> go to feeling it, you know, just whatever comes, come. Right, right. You know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's something that I was uh, also thinking about uh, with regard to Fred's playing is that uh, there 
a lot of times there are saxophonists that seem to be out to uh, establish themselves as the fastest horn in the West mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. And, right. and Fred never seemed to ever give a thought to that. It was mm -hmm. like all he wanted to do was just concentrate on who he was as an artist mm -hmm. and as a musician and his own sound and just make Fred, it de develop naturally. Fred is like oh, a horse with blinders on. You know when you uh -huh. go to the racetrack, they mm -hmm. put the blinders on? Right. Straight ahead. Don't even worry about what's going on or whatever. Because mm -hmm. he got his path and he's working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, don't <laughs> yeah. worry about none of that. <laughs> I mean, he listen to people, but that don't mean nothing. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. I mean, it doesn't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, kid, any final uh, thoughts? Any, anything else you'd like to uh, say about Fred Anderson at this time? Uh, the only thing I can say is Fred is a great human being. Mm -hmm. And he's lived a long time. Mm -hmm. And his, I mean, his health is is good now and he's strong as he ever been. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's recuperating from his, from his health problem. Right. And he, when he, when I first heard him in New York, uh, that was his first gig after his operation and he sounded strong then and he even sounded stronger now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the only thing I can say is that he's like for all the time. He's just keep moving mm -hmm. on and getting better. Mm -hmm. Great. And I know he's going to continue to practice because as a stronger, better he feel, that's the more he's going to practice mm -hmm. to keep working at his art. Because mm -hmm. he's truly an artist. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Kid, thank you very much, man. All right. You were. Yeah, that was beautiful. It was great. Uh, well, it took a long time for us to get this together. Yeah, right? And, you know, it's like 